Okay, Rebecca Brightwell, we're gonna speed through this then. She co-directs the Georgia AgriBility Project. Her primary expertise falls into the following areas, working with rural agricultural populations, including military veterans and underserved populations, assisting individuals with chronic health conditions and or disabilities with worksite and educational accommodations, business planning, marketing for business startups, and universal design for learning curricula design. She also heads the AT Innovation Lab at the University of Georgia. In addition to conducting research, the lab trains over 100 occupational and phys physical therapists each year on AT applications. Kyle Haney is an extension educator at UGA uh, and serves as the field service coordinator for the AgriBility Project. As a mechanical engineer, he has expertise in agricultural adaptive designs and fabrication. Kyle also is part of the AT Innovation Lab at UGA, where he fabricates devices for individuals with disabilities across the lifespan. He trains community members and professionals on AT solutions. And welcome, Rebecca and Kyle. I'm going to. So I don't have. Want me to go ahead and share my screen and get started, or? Please. Okay, great. Okay, is everybody able to see that? Okay, great. <laughs> um, so thank you for having us today. Um, it's a topic we're very excited to talk about. It's a new initiative for us. And it is our mobile learning lab. And as you can see in the picture, it looks beautiful. <laughs> and so um, Kyle and I are excited to share with you how we got to the point of um, getting the lab and a lot of the logistics around it, how we use it, the curricula, and hopefully give you some ideas of how you could do something very similar. Um, I want to start um, by just explaining a little bit of how we're structured because you'll see signage where we're talking about farm again, and you're probably kind of wondering what is that and how does that work with agribility? So I just wanna spend a really quick second to show that to you. Um, at the heart of all of our work is the agribility project. It's where we started in this field. So back in 2005 is when we were first funded with agribility. And as we were working with our clients and farmers across our state, we started seeing needs that the AgriBuildy grant really wasn't designed to address. So we started going out and finding additional funding, additional projects that all complement each other. Um, so many of our AgriBuildy clients are also being served by the other grants. And sometimes we get new AgriBuildy clients because they came through us through another initiative. Um, on the screen, you can kind of see a snapshot of that. Like I say, the one thing they all have in common, they all serve people with in, um, disabilities. And so Ag Start is where we have some foundation funding to really help with business planning for business startups, because we really were starting to get a lot of military veterans coming to our program. And for many of them, they were fairly new to agriculture. Um, we are just ending a grant um, this year um, where we've been training military veterans on food safety, um, which is such an important component, obviously, if you're going to own a farm and understanding that part of farming and growing safe and healthy food. Um, we have a project that's called Farm Boot Camp, and that's to help military veterans um, really get started and exposed to a lot of different um, commodity areas. So it's really a grassroots thing. Um, both experienced and new farmers, though, have participated and really have rated that program really well. Um, AgriLeader is our outreach for females and farming across our state. Um, it's really a growing population here in Georgia as you may be experiencing in your own states as well. Um, as was mentioned earlier in our introduction, we do a lot of training over the years with occupational physical therapists around assistive technology. And our latest um, initiative that we're so excited to be a part of, we're part of the Southern Region Center for the Farm and Stress Assistant Network. So this is a new initiative under the USDA and they've set up regional centers across the United States to really start looking into and connecting people to appropriate resources um, around farm stress, because that's really a growing concern area. 
and it's probably something many of you in your states are experiencing as well. So when we say farm again, it is our umbrella <laughs> that basically encompasses all these great things you see on the screen. So I just wanted to kind of do that introduction so you may hear us mention farm again and you'll understand how that goes. But the heart of all our work is our AgriBuilty project. So why a mobile learning lab? Um, we started really seeing um, several different things we thought the lab could do for us, um, really to be able to bring our trainings directly to different groups we work with, to be able to provide assessments um, out on the farm, um, working with our occupational therapist and physical therapist, um, and then also just a great way to promote our program and what we do and what we work on. So what um, Kyle and I are going to go over today is what our local learning, learning lab contains, um, how we use it for training assessment and project promotion, how we funded it. That's always the big question, right? Like, how do you do this? Um, and then fortunately, because Kyle is an engineer, it was really great having him involved in this because it wasn't as simple sometimes as you think to design a trailer just like you want it and make everybody build it just like you want it. So he'll walk you through um, some of the things he did to make that work. Um, what are our ongoing maintenance costs with this? What we're wanting to do next with it? And then of course, we're just so excited to get your questions because we really do think it's something that could be beneficial to a lot of different groups to use. So I'm gonna start with trainings. Um, we have known, for a long time that how important it was the training aspect of all the work we do because when you're working with different professionals you know vocational rehabilitation as well as medical um, professionals they're obviously working every day with people with disabilities but for in agriculture if it's an area they're not as familiar with they may not feel like it's safe maybe to return someone back to the farm to do their job so we knew that they needed to understand how what the solutions were and success stories of how it works because if they believe in it they're going to really be able to help move that farmer to the outcome that we would want um, we've been doing a lot of in-person trainings ever since 2008 um, really starting with our um, occupational and physical therapist and then later doing some work with vocational rehabilitation which i'll walk you through um, in the past, we hadn't had a lot of success with our vocational rehabilitation program. We have a very strong program here, an excellent program. Um, we really have great counselors. It was mainly just not making the communication connection, right? Really trying to explain um, our work and what we do. And then so they can understand how it works within their framework. So we decided to do a two day training with VR. And so this was our first time doing an in-person training with them and really sparked the idea of the mobile learning lab as well. So I wanna walk you through what that looked like and then the successes we had with that. So it was really great because um, the AWT department there, so that's our assistive work technology group. Um, we're fortunate in Georgia, we have a group totally dedicated to assistive technology within VR. And so they came down and we did a two day in-person training. Um, and so it was great to have the VR support because they actually paid for part of the expenses of the training where we covered the rest. So it was definitely a joint effort. Um, we had some of the head people in VR there. So if there were policy questions, which was a big thing a lot of the counselors had, there was somebody there who could address that portion of it. Um, so we had presentations on the first day, um, we had farm tours, which were incredibly popular, and then we had a huge AT Expo. So the, a lot of vendors came down that sell assistive technology, the people were able to try it out. I mean, it really, really went well. Um, I would say it's probably one of our highest rated um, workshops. Here's some of the comments you can see on the screen. Um, that they just really enjoyed the day, enjoyed the investment in time. They were looking forward to their first agricultural clients. And so it really got us excited um, to see the energy behind it. And the counselors were very excited as well. They were really looking forward to this new experience for a lot of them. And some of them were very new to the farming and agricultural world. So what did that mean for us? Um, so if you look in 2015, so this is um, what it's showing is the number of dollars in VR funding over time. 
And so in 2015 is when we did the workshop. You can see we had a huge spike um, as far as the number of um, farmer cases that were being supported by VR, as well as getting some really good outcomes for those farmers. Um, we did have a dip because as I'm sure every state experiences, sometimes there are budget freezes that happen around. So we did have a category freeze for a little while, but then we went back trending up. Um, so we really saw the success of doing that outreach and working directly with VR. Um, like I said, we're fortunate to have a very strong VR here. It was mainly just making that connection and doing more education around this area. So what we wanted to do is um, what we were fortunate those VR, um, that VR group, you know, the AWT specialists, the assistive work technology specialists, were able to take that much time off work to come do an engaged training like that. But we knew that probably wasn't feasible for the VR counselors in a lot of the offices, as well as other professionals we work with, including you know, physical um, and occupational therapists. So what the mobile lab allows us to do is to bring the training directly to the group. So if a VR office can only spare an hour, we have an hour option. <laughs> if somebody wants to invest up to four hours, we'll be there you know, as long as we can. Um, so we really want an adaptable curricula like that. And so we can bring the training directly to people. Um, currently, we have four learning stations, and those are very organic. You know, we have definitely things we're doing right now, but as we hear from our audience and identify needs or gaps we might be seeing, we may introduce new learning stations. Um, so in our trailer, um, you can see there's a front window that lets down, so we're able to be in there if we need to, um, to communicate, talk out. But what happens is we go into a parking lot and then we spread out with the different learning stations. So we have tools and personal safety items, mobility, equipment, equipment adaptations, and then technology. So those are our primary stations. And so when a group comes in, we can divide them up into smaller groups and so they can have a real personal experience and they can rotate between the different learning stations that we have. So on um, tools and personal safety, um, we have a lot of different hand tools and tool adaptations that people like and they can handle and hold and try and see. Um, we have, um, that's where our cooling vests are, you know, a lot of things that they can look at and try on and experience. And then for each station, we do have a curricula we kind of follow where we um, have it written where anyone who's teaching this will have sort of a guide to kind of help them. So we have what the station is, how the instructors to be interacting with them, the what and why the station, why does the station even exist, what materials they need, about how long it will take. Um, so that makes it really easy. In this case, we have um, someone from VR who actually came and helped us this day to man one of the stations. So that was really great. And it's a great way for us to also work with our VR staff. The next station is equipment. And so one thing I'm really excited about, um, and I'll kind of give you an idea of how our curricula sheet reads, but if you look down um, in this left corner, you see the two gentlemen sitting at the steering wheels that are like mimic tractors. So I'll explain to you what that station is. We were really running across where um, we might need to get a change in tractor seat for farmers because some of our new farmers were having older tractors who may have older seats on it. Um, even with our extension agents, sometimes they didn't know of all the variety of seats there were and things like that. So this is a simulation exercise. So these two tractor um, simulations are on a platform and it can mimic terrain that a tractor might be on. One has a very standard seat and one has a great suspension seat that we might ask for. So like the what, why, um, just to read this out to kind of give you an idea of how this is framed, but farmers often need different tractor seats than what they currently have. For someone with back injuries or spinal cord injuries, a traditional tractor seat may be uncomfortable and could cause additional injuries. For instance, someone with a spinal cord injury may not have sensation to know that they're causing additional friction injuries. Suspension seating plays a vital role on comfort, performance, safety, and health of the driver. 
They move and adjust with the vibrations and the movement of the tractor. In addition, knee pads may be recommended for individuals with spinal cord injuries so their knees do not vibrate and cause skin deterioration. So that kind of gives a framework for the presenter to kind of explain why they are experiencing that. And then they're able to get on it and actually see what it's like. Another thing we have, if you look um, in the center here, um, kind of showing how it might be hard to lift a gas can to fill, um, you know, fill the gas into a tractor. And then we have a transfer pump that's below it that's showing just an inexpensive solution that we've actually put on a lot of our farms has really been incredibly helpful. So there, we want it touch and feel, right? You know, we want every station you can go and experience it, touch it, feel it, and see what it's like. Mobility, um, we have an action track chair and we have a journeyman scooter. We're hoping to add um, some other different types of mobility devices in time um, with what we have. So that's always real popular. We do let them drive the journeyman scooter around, which they seem to really enjoy a lot in trainings. And depends on the group who we end up letting drive. Of course, if it's a younger group, <laughs> we may not allow that privilege. But with our um, counselors and with our therapists, definitely they get to try things out. And so technology is our next one. The newest station we're working on right now is really around drones. And for people to understand how those are really helpful in agriculture, it's general, but it's incredibly helpful for someone who may have mobility issues on the farm. Um, we have backup cameras, GPS, automatic gate openers, a lot of different things that they can see how technology works. And once again, it's great for the therapist and all to see this. So they see in person and when we're making a recommendation, they understand why and how it's being used. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Kyle and he'll pick it up from here. Let me unmute myself. Um, we also wanted uh, to be able to do assessments and promotion with our mobile learning lab. And so for the assessments, we're able to take our mobile learning lab across the state um, to any of the farmers that we're working with. And it really allows them to be able to try out the assistive technology and make sure it will work for their specific situation. Um, it also helps to reduce AT abandonment for us, just to make sure that they are comfortable with the chair uh, and that it fits all of their needs and tasks around the farm. One thing when we're working with vocational rehab and they approve to purchase uh, one of these chairs for the farmer, they have to have a seating assessment done by an occupational therapist. We've run into problems um, getting during the seating assessment of being able to try and find a chair to bring to the seating assessment because sometimes the dealer or manufacturer is located in a different state or they can't make it work with their schedule to get a chair there so the farmer can, um, can be in the chair and the occupational therapist can look at it and make proper seating supports to match the specific wheelchair. Um, a lot of the time we were struggling to find another farmer that had had one previously um, and ask him if we could pick the chair up and um, bring it to the seating assessment or if they'd be bring it to the seating assessment. And so this allows us to be able to easily transport our own chairs to the seating assessment so we don't have to worry about um, coordinating with anyone else's schedule and allows that occupational therapist to have uh, the chair there so they can make all the necessary recommendations. For promotion, um, the, the graphics that we put on the side of the trailer really help promote our project as we're going down the road. When we stop at gas stations, you wouldn't believe the people who come up and wanna know about the project. Um, it's definitely a rolling billboard for us. And you can see the back of the trailer as it's going down the road and someone's behind us, they have, they have our phone number, website, and then our projects underneath that. And we also take it to the um, Sunbelt Ag Expo every year. That's one of the largest uh, Ag Expos in the Southeast. And we're also getting a, um, a large number of fairs and festivals we're going to as well with school groups um, or county and community events that we're able to take the trailer to. So to go in a little bit of how we funded the dream, we our extension program here at the University of Georgia 
offers an innovation grant every year and we are awarded $10,000, which helped to cover the uh, initial cost of the trailer and a little bit of the wrap. But there were some other additional funding and I'll let Becky speak a little bit to that funding. Yeah, I just wanted to explain because I know this is different if you're in a university environment, some of you are and some of you aren't. But um, because this differs between different universities, our university um, for PIs, um, Principal Investigators for Writing Grants, they do a few little incentives where you um, get a small amount of your indirect costs back. Um, in addition, if you're partially state funded or fully state funded, as you're moving yourself off state funding into grant funding, um, they have something called salary savings. And this is more, I'm not, don't want y'all to think that this is a lot of money. <laughs> it's not, we kind of accumulate it over time, but, um, but it did enable us to buy a lot of the equipment um, that Kyle's gonna share in just a minute, that like the chairs and the stuff we put in there. So I chose to use every dime that I'm getting in any of those pockets of kind of going back into the mobile learning lab. So I'll turn it back to you, Kyle. Uh, we also did some fundraising with Jams and Jellies. We have a company here in Georgia who makes these for us, um, and we're able to, to sell them to the public and be able to raise some money that way. We also take donations, so if anybody is ready to write a check today, um, we can add more stuff to the mobile learning lab. So just to give you an idea of how much everything was to, to build and stock the trailer, if you were uh, wanted to do this in your state, the trailer cost um, $7,135. That was just for the trailer, which was um, did not have all the pretty graphics on it. It was a white trailer on the outside. And then the cost for us to be able to put the graphics on the outside was $4,224. Uh, in addition to that, we purchased the action track chair and the journeyman scooter, and then a variety of hand tools and equipment adaptations that you saw in the previous slides. Um, we also have a lot of organizational materials that you'll need um, at, if you go this route. So we have tables, we have um, uh, extension cords, generators, fans, trying to make sure um, that we're able to, no matter where we're going, um, we can be able to power everything that we need to and keep it all in a manageable uh, way because, you know, this takes an hour or two to set up prior to the actual event. So uh, the more you can keep it organized and all the assistive technology and stations together, the better that you'll be able to sit, set up and break down. The ongoing costs that we have associated with our trailer, uh, for us here in Georgia, registration is only about $20 for a trailer. For us, insurance is really cheap because we are um, on the state insurance with the university. And so it only runs us about $14 a year for full coverage. I know that's probably going to differ depending on if you're with an institution um, or a private uh, company. And so $200 is probably a good estimate on insurance for an enclosed trailer like this. Uh, and then tires, that's really depending on how much you drive it, but that's probably every five years for us um, and about $150 just for the tires on the trailer. And then caulking $15 every couple of years for um, to make sure that we don't have any water leaking into of the trailer and that's just necessary maintenance that you need to do and then greasing the axles about five dollars every couple of years one and the first thing we did when we got the trailer was to make sure that we went out and bought locks for it thus locks for the doors the we had like um, you saw earlier one whole side opens up on the trailer and then the back ramp but we also have the tongue on the trailer where you know it goes on the truck um you want to make sure you put a, a lock there because uh, enclosed trailers are stolen very frequently. So just make sure that you take time to lock up your investment. To go into a little bit about the build out, um, it, it, it was a very quick process. They build uh, enclosed trailers very quickly and we it only took two months from the time we started getting quotes until we had the trailer in our parking lot. Um, after that, you know, we had to put the wrap on, which took another two weeks or so. But it's, communication is key to get everything the way you want it. We just started with a simple sketch like the one on the left. Um, I then took it into and put it in AutoCAD to send to the trailer manufacturer. But something like just that drawing there would work for you. Uh, a lot of the time, you're going to be working with a dealer and not the manufacturer. So 
um, it helps to make sure you check out who's going to manufacture the trailer just to make sure that it's a quality company. Uh, we actually worked with a company here in Georgia and the quality has been fabulous. We, uh, everything on the inside of the trailer was just the way we wanted it. As you can see, you know, we, they have a model of trailer and then you have to put in add-ins. And so we put in the uh, rubberized floor, non-slip floor on the bottom. Uh, we have cabinets that we put in, um, really had to take time to talk through all the cabinet situation and how they wanted it. And then our um, interior walls, we added, because usually enclosed trailers just come with plywood on the walls. And so we had a white vinyl all the way around. Um, we have lights and then we have those, the door placement. Um, with the wrap, you want to make sure that you have a good sign company who does the wrap. The one that we worked with was very, because the trailer has so many openings, they were very good in taking measurements and working with our graphic designer to make sure that somebody's face on the side of the trailer wasn't right in the door seam. And so you, half their face was showing or half of it wasn't, or um, our phone number, you know, half is on the side and half is on the back. They really made sure that it, the placement was good for people seeing um, all the different graphics. Our future plans with the trailer, uh, we are in the process of developing a K-12 curricula. We, we're getting a lot of requests from school groups who are wanting to have this out of their ag fairs or come out to the ag school for, um, for a day to be able to show off a different assistive technology and get the kids interested in a young age uh, and then be able to outreach to maybe th their parents as well. We also uh, are hoping to get a small lift for demonstrations to be able to show what a tractor lift or a truck lift, um, the principle behind that. And then we're looking for more adaptive tools. Um, as we saw earlier, we're looking for a drone learning station. And then another key critical one is the PTO hookup station um, and the implement hookup in general. A lot of people who don't farm don't understand how difficult this is for a farmer to be able to um, hook and unhook pieces of equipment. So we really want to make that known how hard it is, but then have the solution with it, which is the automatic hitches. And now the um, automatic hitches that can also connect the PTO shaft. We'll uh, open it up to questions at this time. And we really encourage you to ask um, anything and we'll be glad to help. If, you're, if this is something that you envision your program doing as well, we'll, we'll give as much information as we can. Uh oh. Elizabeth, do you have a question? No. So uh, we have a question in the chat box and it says, uh, what are the dimensions on the trailer? Uh, our trailer is a seven, uh, foot wide by 12 feet long, and it has the V nose front on it, um, which gives us a little extra space there. You can never go too big on your trailer. Um, we filled it up <laughs> really quickly, just the 12 foot trailer. It's been a great size for us. It's easy to maneuver around the state, um, get into cities and get, um, you know, or out in rural areas, but we would love it. You know, <laughs> we're, we've, seen all these stations we want to add more stations and so you know we'd like to look at to a bigger trailer at some point it does you know talking about the dimensions of the trailer the bigger you go the bigger truck you're going to need um, our trailer works very well for a 1500 uh, chevy silverado that's what we're pulling the trailer with and you want to make sure um, you know the bigger you go if you, you have the additional um, weight distribution bars on your truck and um, electric trailer brakes to be able to help when braking. Um, yes, we do. We put everything inside of our um, trailer. Um, to carry with us. And that's what Kyle was saying. We kind of fill, <laughs> we fill it up quick, I think, with what we have in there. Um, but one thing we're looking at as well um, is another way to transport some additional stuff in a second vehicle. 
Um, so we're trying to look at some flexibility with that. We don't necessarily take everything with us. It'll depend on the time frame we're given. So if it's only an hour, we would um, be able to, you know, bring just enough stations to cover what that is. It's when we do the longer days that it becomes more of a challenge because then we're kind of bringing every station with us. So, but right now we are squeezing <laughs> it all within that trailer capacity. So. Uh, we have a question about uh, where the trailer is registered. If it's registered by the university, where is it housed? And then um, if owned by the university, are there restrictions on who can drive it? Yes, so it is registered by the university and it is housed right outside our, um, our building on campus. It's uh, in our back parking lot and which is university property. And since it is owned by the university, only um, university employees can drive it. Um, and they have to have a, they have to go through training each and every year on um, operating a state vehicle, but then that allows us to be able to tow the trailer across the state. And Richard, you've asked about the workbook um, that we have. Um, the workbook had quite a few things in it. Um, part of our day training is going through um, just farm culture, farm statistics for Georgia, you know, a lot of background just about agriculture. So the workbook contains that. Um, it also contains some information that VR wanted to put in the book since they were covering some policy things and things like that. Um, so it was definitely a resource about different ag operations as well. So we had a section that just kind of walked through some of the ag operations. And a lot of that was tied to where we were going on the farm tour so they could understand the task involved. Like with, um, we went to a strawberry farm so they understood the bending and everything kind of associated with that kind of operation. And then when we went to look at it, it made a lot more sense during the farm tour. So. Uh, Mackenzie asked about if we built the uh, tractor seat stations and we did. Um, we actually built them at our shop down in Tifton and we have a, um, it comes apart in three different sections and the seat stays attached to the base, but then the, the part painted in red actually detaches from the base and allows us to be able to get to fit everything inside the trailer. But we have a a vibration motor on the platform base that allows us to be able to um, turn up and down the vibrations to mimic the different uh, terrains, but also the different tractor vibrations that you're going to get from the engine uh, of the tractor itself. And then the hood is just a, a hood off of a tractor that I had at my house. Um, and we just painted it and put it on the front of there to, to make it look more realistic, I guess. Any other questions out there? Well, just know Kyle and I are a resource for you. Um, so like later, if you have questions, you know, do not hesitate because I know with me, sometimes I have to process things and kind of think how I will use this. Um, if you want to email us, our generic email is farm again, all together, um, farm again at uga.edu and we look at that several times a day. So um, we'll route it to the right person to answer your question, but do feel free um, to, at any time to reach out to us because, and we're gonna be tracking very much um, our success with this. We did have one big event. Kyle, do you wanna tell them about the a &R training? That you sure. Used to yeah, we um, went to a quarterly training that our university has for extension agents, whether that's um, agriculture and natural resources, family and consumer science agents, and 4-H agents. Um, and we were able to take the mobile learning lab to that and had over 70 people rotate through the stations uh, during an afternoon. But it really allowed us to be able to let them know about our project. And this was only for um, a portion of our, the Northwest portion of our state but they were able to engage with it. And then from that, uh, we had a lot of response saying, agents saying, we want you to come out to our county ag day. We want this at our school group. 
Um, so it really generated a lot of response that way. And so if you are with the university, it's a great way for extension agents to really get um, involved with your project and know what you know, know what you actually do um, on a day to day basis with farmers and then be able to share that with their community. Um, there's a question about our AT demonstration tools. Um, we put a very small amount in our agribility grant. Um, I think it's like $300 for different assistive technology demonstration items. So we are able to use that to buy some of the hand tools that we use. And then in addition, we use the other funds that we have coming in um, as we covered earlier to buy some of those things too. But we do have a small amount of money, yes, in our agribility project. And I'm not sure, but I, and if somebody else um, can offer this, but I know some projects, I think, budget much more for AT demonstration items. So I, I think it, you know, it'd be a question <laughs> for the funding agency, but I think they're very open to that. I don't think that's a problem. It just can't go into, I think, the equipment category, you know, where it starts getting more pricey. This is Lonnie. How many, you may have already answered this. Uh, how many events do you do a year? Well, I guess pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah, Pre-COVID, it was all in-person workshops. So it wasn't unusual for us to train, you know, maybe do four or five big events a year um, and probably train somewhere around the 200 person range. Um, now that we're kind of we're in a weird place again because <laughs> our cases in Georgia are really cranking up. So like we were getting some momentum to pop out. So we did this big a &R training. It's our first training um, with the mobile learning lab. Um, so it was a great test. We had like 67 people participate in that day. And we have two invitations now to go out to ag days that we're scheduling soon. Um, so our goal with this would be at least right now based off our time and funding and things like that, looking at like once a month, you know, to try to hit different VR offices in different places. Um, and then supplemented to that would be any school groups and things like that that have been requesting us to come out. But we want to at least have a once a month targeted thing to eat with either our therapist or our vocational rehabilitation counselors. So we're hoping we don't get slowed down too much with what's going on right now. So um, in the meantime, we're building the dream. We can get more things in it and working more and more and refining our stations. But that would be our objective is to do at least once a month with targeted groups and then supplement it in there with um, in invitations that we're getting. So. I have another, oh, go ahead. Um, do we charge for our training sessions? No, we don't, yeah, they're free. Um, to say that for, I'll back that up, for the mobile learning lab, it's free. When we go out and do occupational physical therapy trainings, we do have um, fees for that, but they're also in conjunction with the Shepherd Center, which is a brain and spinal cord hospital we work with. And because of the credits the therapists need, it's pretty expensive on our end. So we do charge something to cover some of those expenses. Um, let's see, do you manage the events yourselves or do we have volunteers? Um, it's a combination. We're very fortunate that um, VR um, helped us out with the last event we had. So we were able to man our stations that way. Um, we definitely would be very open to volunteers. And one of the reasons that we're writing the script of the different stations like it is, is so people would feel comfortable manning the station know what information to present and how to present it. So I think it's very adaptable in that way. I think you can make it where you could definitely use volunteers um, as well. You just need to do a little training with them ahead of time. And let's see, um, do you wanna talk about the fuel transfer pump, Kyle? Sure, um, we had a question that asked, what's the manufacturer of the fuel transfer pump? This one is, the one that we got was a Northern Tool um, house brand. Um, I believe it's Ironton. Um, but a really good brand of fuel transfer pumps that we have found for farms uh, is Philrite. Northern Tool is a company that we have registered as a vendor for our vocational rehab. And so that's one of the reasons that we 
we went through them to get this pump is because it's something that we can show um, vocational rehab. This is a vendor that's already in your system. And so when you're working with a farmer, uh, you can you already know that you can use uh, this group for um, a purchase of this assistive technology. And a lot of our um, AT and our mobile learning lab, almost all of it comes from vendors that are already read, already in vocational rehabs vendor management system. So that way it's very seamless uh, when they go to go to purchase um, assistive technology for our farmers. And then um, the question, is there any a demo AT you would not include if you did it over? Not at the moment. I think we feel really good with the stations we have and we're really looking at what to add. But to that point, when I was saying it's organic, we really want to look at the feedback we're getting back and the outcomes that are coming out of it to really see if people responded to it and did it accomplish what we had hoped it would be. And is it still relevant? You know, um, over time, different things may be more relevant than others. So I think the key to this is, is not to get stuck with just what you originally come up with, um, to constantly be willing to adapt to your audience. And then, uh, you know, always keeping the farmer need at the heart. You know, if we see farmers are having problems getting something funded because people may not understand why it's so necessary in their operation, it might be worth doing a training, you know, module around that, you know, just to kind of explain it. The tractor seats was a real big one and it really has accomplished what we had hoped that would do. And that was really trying to understand how different seats really make a huge difference, especially if you have a spinal cord injury. So things like that have been very helpful, you know, to us, but um, Kyle, do you, is there anything you would change at this point? No, um, just a thing to be aware of when you're putting stuff in your mobile learning lab is to make sure it's easy to get in and out of there. Um, weight wise, you know, you don't want to be lugging something at that point, then you might want to, uh, after your back's tired after a while, um, you may not want it in the mobile learning lab, but like our tractor seat, our upgraded one, it was a $1,500 seat. Um, and it weighs, I think, 150 pounds because it has that air ride suspension underneath it. Our demonstration items are able to be, they have wheels on them. And so we're able to pick up one end of them and it makes it really easy for us to move it in and out of the trailer. So just keep that in mind as you're putting stuff in your trailer, make sure it's something that you can pick up or have a way to easily get it into your trailer, like with wheels on it. Yeah, and not because and it's really important because like what if Kyle or Mason on um, our team wasn't there and it was me trying to do it, that is a major consideration, you know, um, it has to be something I can move in and out. Um, as we move forward and we're looking at different things there are also little power things like you've seen at grocery stores where they move carts and stuff, <laughs> they've got smaller versions of those so you know we could always look into some assisted things that could help move things around that might make it easier, for instance, if someone weak like me <laughs> is trying to do this. So we definitely, it's a consideration of um, thinking about this. Um, to keep your selection up to date. Um, yeah, basically the money that I was mentioning that I'm getting um, as a faculty member that, you know, once again, I don't want y'all to think I'm sitting here rolling in dough because I'm not, but every dime I get of that money, I'm reinvesting in things we need there. Um, so our big thing right now is saving up for the lift. Um, we know that will be important. We're thinking about doing a small standing lift because that would be an easier thing um, for us to do for this. And then we can show blow ups and things like that of the seated lift so they could see that ahead. Um, so, you know, when you're talking about swapping things out, I think, you know, once again, we're doing this somewhat on a shoestring budget. Um, I would say we're probably going to be investing 500 to $1,000 a year um, at looking at different things we want to add to this and do with this. I think that's a reasonable number for us to meet, unless we have some big rush on jams and jellies. <laughs> Maybe we could do more. We're hoping for a big Christmas season. Um, but um, I do think that's important. You're right. You know, you want to constantly be thinking about how to keep it fresh because you don't want this to be stale, either curricula design wise or what you're showing. Um, it needs to be relevant, you know, to what's out there. Let's see, have you connected with your state AT fund? No, we have not. Um, that is a connection we need to make. They've had some changes on our level. So 
we need to reach back out with them and talk to them more about it um, to kind of see. We had reached out to them to ask them how they were doing their loan program because that's something else that we're looking for um, doing as another project is um, for an ag loan assistive technology program. And so that might be a great way also for us to make a stronger connection with them. But we have a great group in Georgia. We just need to make that connection a little bit stronger. So. Any more questions? I think this is excellent. My mind is just reeling with ideas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a affordable project, you know. I mean, I know it doesn't sound like, you know, because you're probably talking about once you add the equipment and all in and your trailer and all that. I mean, would you say we're around 20,000 in right now, Kyle? Somewhere mm -hmm. around 15 to 20. Um, but you can build it over time. You know, at first it can be a few small things. You can use it mainly for promotion and getting out. And, you know, and if you're in a university environment, you know, pitch the idea, you know, you may not have this particular grant like um, the College of Ag had here, but they're, I'm sure, you know, that they could get interested in it, maybe find some seed money. So, I mean, I wouldn't hesitate to ask within your own groups, you know, you might be surprised what you get. And then like us, you just start building it over time. And some of the things we had been gathering over time, you know, there's this old saying where I think it was in, I don't know, the Alps or somewhere, they built the bridge before there was a train. Um, so they knew the train would come. And so that's kind of been us. We've, we've been kind of building and hoarding stuff and sticking stuff different places, knowing that eventually the trailer would come. So even if you're not quite ready for the trailer, just start doing that, you know, just start putting some things aside, you know, some things that you can use and then just know eventually the trailer will be there. So. <laughs> And we really appreciate all your positive feedback. We're looking at this, you know, thank you for the, you know, the encouragement you're giving us. That's very, um, really helps us keep excited about this. Um, and we appreciate your support. And like I said, we're totally here for you guys. So, you know, as you're trying to think through things, we're happy to help. And um, Kyle has a lot of experience out with the lab. So he can answer a lot of things about the audience connection and things like that. And as we mentioned, we're working on our K-12 curricula because I haven't ever developed a um, curricula for K-12 and there are very different parameters that they're looking for in learning objectives. So we're working through that process right now, but that's also a big request we're getting is with that age group. So we're definitely gonna be flushing that out soon. Um, have we had any equipment manufacturers interested in donating equipment? We've had a lot of deals cut. Um, we've had some that they either are heavily discounting it um, some have done it at cost. No one's given us anything yet. We're trying for that. <laughs> That's our goal. But right now, the nice thing is that they have been very supportive about giving us good deals on things. We're not, I don't think we've paid retail for anything, have we, Kyle? Except mm -hmm. for our hand tools. I mean, a lot of that we order off Amazon and different places. But um, but if any of y'all are with the art, work with the Arthritis Foundation or do things like that, um, I know sometimes they can be generous about donating like their Fisker line of tools that are more gentle on the hands and things like that. So that's also an avenue to think about. We've had donations from them in the past for other things. So we are using those tools. They haven't directly, you know, since we've had the mobile learning lab donated something, but they have given us stuff in the past. Um, so, but they do like to do it through like a group that's already kind of working with them, either your state arthritis foundation group or whatever, but um, that's also an idea for you. Um, a lot of times they seem to be real generous. So, so if y'all know anywhere we can get free equipment, <laughs> pass it on. <laughs> and to, just one thing I'll add real fast. One thing we do as well, when we have a farmer, when I was talking about this AT loan thing, it's also between farm and farmer. Um, we do have where farmers no longer using the lift or something they may have. And um, because maybe their situation, their health is deteriorated or something's happened. So we are trying to make a lot of positive connections where farmers can share equipment between each other. 
So that seemed real positive. We're just in the grassroots of that. So we're just now starting trying to maneuver what that means and how we set up something like that. But, um, but that's also another way to keep equipment going. So. There's one question about, is it safe to use a drill motor to pump fuel? <laughs> um, I guess it depends on what the drill is. I know I've seen some that a uh, cordless drill, if, it, if you're in a high enough speed and you go to stop the drill, you'll all of a sudden see um, some arc occurring in the back of the drill. Um, I've seen that on several different drills. So that would be something I would be cautious about. The, the fuel transfer pumps that we use are uh, battery powered. They, they do just hook up to a 12 volt car battery. Um, they have alligator clips on the end of it. One goes to the positive, um, one to the negative. And you can also, uh, you can also make it where, you know, you're connecting to the battery on a vehicle as well to be able to power your fuel transfer pump. But I would be cautious of sparks from a drill around your, um, around your fuel. And Laura, your question about the tools for life. Um, I was talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, we definitely worked with them in the past on different things. We have not worked with them yet on the mobile learning lab. Um, so it is a connection that we definitely want to be making. Um, so we're hoping to do that soon and kind of share with them what we're doing. They are aware about us um, trying to get some more information about our loan program um, between our AT loan program we're hoping to start. Um, and it'd be neat if we could do it in conjunction with them, but we're in baby steps with that. But I think it's definitely um, a very strong connection we need to make. So. Any more, oh, there's a nice job, question mark. I think he meant to say exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Just real quick before, um, if anybody has any more questions, um, feel free, Rebecca and Kyle are still here, but please follow the link um, in the chat box to complete the evaluation um, about today's session. And again, this session will be, and the slides will be archived on the NAP page. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can contact Tess. And I know that Rebecca, you put your email in the chat. Did you do that also, Kyle? That's our general one. So it goes to all of us. So okay. we can use that. Yeah. Great, great, great. Thank you. Thanks very much, you guys. This was great. We enjoyed it. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you.